most monumental, like impactful, life-changing moments of my life being there. 2015 was also the year that I was first elected president of the YPD and now as I am in stride of my last year uh, of my term, I just think it's incredible to find myself back where I started. And we're celebrating young people, black young people who are matriculating and doing well in life. And it's just a testament to how far you can come in such a short amount of time. And then in the black community, it's hard for us to celebrate our victories because it's so much happening around us and it's so much madness that occurs. But just being here reminded me and made me so happy uh, because so much good can come from bad things and we can overcome and we consistently persist. And it's just an honor to be here with you. So thank you for having me. To the ministerial staff, uh, Ms. Alexis, who preached this eight o'clock service this morning. We had an incredible time yesterday. She took me to get some Mexican food. I had some salmon. And then they brought some little sauce out or whatever. It was good. It was good. It was good. I want you all to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. Jesus, be fence all around me every day. Jesus, I want you to protect me as I travel along the way. I know you will, yes, Lord. I know you can, yes, Lord. Fight my battles if I keep still. Lord, be a fence all around me every day. Can y'all sing that with me one time? All right. Jesus, be a fence all around me every day. thank you for this opportunity to just be in your presence. God, we thank you for this space and time to just utter the words, Jesus, and watch things change, God. We ask that you silence the speaker down and turn yourself up. Let your word be heard so that the sinner might become running, asking, what must I do to be saved, to know the God that he is talking about? We thank you, God, for all that you do and all that you're going to do in our lives. Let this word be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. First Samuel chapter 17, verses 32. Just say amen when you have it. Amen. amen. It reads, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. David said to Saul, don't trip. Your servant will go and fight him. I like to preach to you all today from the sermon topic of I Ain't Your Underdog. I know this is an academic Sunday. Sorry for my grammar, but that's the title. I Ain't Your Underdog. Can somebody say that back to me real quick? I Ain't Your Underdog. All right. The underdog story. A circumstance in which the competitor 
has a little or no chance of winning at all. We all know and celebrate many stories that include an underdog theme. Most recently, during Super Bowl 52, if we have any football fans, uh, we witnessed the Philadelphia Eagles, I heard some fans back there, <laughs> proclaim underdogs, yeah. defeat the New England Patriots. Millions of people were shocked in disarray and left in a state of disbelief because they could not comprehend how the Philadelphia Eagles could defeat an NFL powerhouse dynasty like the New England Patriots. They were the underdogs. And subsequently, nobody expected them to win. On this Sunday, I would like to prevent that, present that as problematic. When we think of the negative connotations associated with being called an underdog, we realize the hazardous, the dangerous nature of such themes. An underdog, someone who is less likely to win and who shouldn't be in such close proximity to victory or success. Underdog implies the opposition is unequivocally better. And even if defeated, said opposition's failure is something that was not supposed to happen. Underdog assumes that hard work and dedication did not elevate the individual, but some mystical force allowed triumph to occur. In order to provide a better understanding of the term underdog, we should review the origin of the word. It originates from the 19th century dog fights. Uh, fights were comprised of two opposing dogs. Those dogs would attack each other, and the loser would be referred to as the underdog, the winner, top dog. From looking at a historical context of the word, we realize that underdog is a term coined for defeat. It is used to identify a loser not worthy of being considered a top dog. It is a word that today when used epitomizes what many of us refer to as young people, help me, being slept on. We all know and understand what it's like to experience people sleeping on us, right? To have to deal with someone overlooking our worth is the burden of being slept on. There are those who will sleep on you due to how jealous they are of the way that God is working in your life. Uh, there are those who will sleep on you in order to take advantage of you. Uh, there are those who will sleep on you in order to prevent you from reaching your full potential. There are those who will dedicate so much of themselves to sleeping on you that eventually even you yourself get tired. Beloved, people love to sleep on you when they believe you are an underdog. In Michigan, residents of the city of Flint are being slept on as the water crisis continues and children endure the health effects of lead poisoning. In our own classroom, students are being slept on by classmates and teachers who fail to realize the brilliance young people possess. Here in Chicago and all across the nation, the lives and well-being of black individuals is being slept on by our police forces and justice systems. Amidst our workplaces, social spaces, and even churches, women are slept on as equity persists as a problem. People love to sleep on you when they believe you are an underdog. Furthermore, as religious traditions attempt to assume that the story of David and Goliath is an underdog theme, 
I'd like to submit that in fact, it is not. And we've been sleeping on David. The text describes Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4, by saying a champion named Goliath, who was from Gad, came out to Philistine camp. His height was approximately nine feet, nine inches. Nine feet, nine inches. His challenger, a shepherd boy who was equipped with a sling. Through a stereotypical lens, who David is and what he is equipped with does not measure up to the stature of his opposition. However, through a historical critical assertion of the text, it is to be realized that some of us may have underestimated David and his abilities. Malcolm Gladwell in his book, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants, submits that although David is not similar in stature to Goliath, he still skillfully intended on conquering the giant. Uh, he details this submission by providing a description of ancient warfare and gives special attention to the sling that David carried. Uh, archers or slingers, members of the military, traditionally utilized the same type of sling that David uses in order to kill heavy infantry during war. Uh, David, before his battle with Goliath, equips himself with the necessary tools for victory. Which leads me to the first point I would like to make clear in this preaching moment, is that when we equip ourselves with the necessary tools, we too can overcome giants. <laughs> David's weapon of choice was a sling. Uh, in using a sling to defeat Goliath, David took a stone and placed it into a leather pouch. He attached two string cords to that pouch. He then, in order to build momentum, began whirling the stone rapidly around his head. The more momentum David built up, the more powerful the impact of the stone. Beloved, let this be an example of how to make giants fall. As we face giants in our communities, churches, schools, social spaces, and begin whirling our metaphorical slingshots, we should realize that just as David slung the slingshot around and around to build momentum, the more momentum he built, the more powerful the impact. We must, too, build ourselves up with more momentum for a more powerful impact. The more audacity, the more bravery, the more intelligence, the more faith, the more love, the more resilience, the more adversity, the more patience, the more commitment, the more education, the more prayer, the more powerful the impact of our lives and this giants. When we equip ourselves with the necessary tools, giants begin to fall. Bad grades begin to fall. Bullies begin to fall. White supremacy begins to fall. Hatred begins to fall. Greed begins to fall. The more momentum, the more powerful the impact. And I can imagine David whirling the sling, trying to build momentum while the other soldiers were on the battlefield, taking bets, putting money on the champion Goliath. I can see them laughing and doubting David in an attempt to kill his momentum as he builds it. In life, we encounter people who will try and kill the momentum we are building with doubt and disbelief. And I want to let one or two believers know that you can't always listen to what people assume about you. As a matter of fact, the next time you are building momentum and dealing with doubt, just remind yourself, if it doesn't turn me up, then I'ma tune it out. If it doesn't turn you up, then tune it out. And tell yourself, I'm not weak, I am strong. I am not a failure, I'm going to accomplish my dreams. I am powerful, I am equipped with the right tools. Beloved, don't listen to the doubt and disbelief. Keep whirling, build your momentum, because the more momentum, the more powerful the impact. And David, as he prepares for battle, then denies himself the armor and the weaponry 
he is given as if he knew he would not make use of it. The shepherd boy in this moment conveys the second point by demonstrating that people's negative thoughts and perceptions of us should not prevent us from being ourselves. King Saul wanted to put on armor onto David in order to achieve victory in battle. However, David, having confidence in his abilities, denies himself armor. And I can imagine that Saul in this moment tried to persuade David to put the armor on by telling him how weak he is and saying that he will need armor to protect his small body against the giant. Before this battle with Goliath, David had killed lions and bears without armor, protecting his sheep. And so David was intent about not allowing the king's perception of him to change who he was and how he did things. Uh, we all have King Saul's in our lives. Individuals that try and convince us that who we are and how we do things isn't good enough. The people that talk down to us because they'd rather see us failing doing things our way than succeed doing things our own. Uh, I'm talking about those individuals who tell us we are too short, we are too young, we are too ugly, too compassionate, too understanding, and something about us needs to change in order for us to accomplish our goals. Beloved, David knew that who he was would be enough to conquer giants. He understood what Mahatma Gandhi meant by saying, I will not let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet. Uh, we will encounter people who will try and walk through our mind with doubt on the bottom of their feet, with insecurity on the bottom of their feet, with hatred on the bottom of their feet. But like David, we mustn't let people's perceptions change who we are and how we do things. David essentially communicates to King Saul that before you walk through my mind, you have to wipe your feet at the door. Many times we will have to remind people, sometimes you just got to let folks know, wipe your feet at the door. I am above and not beneath. I am the head and not the tail. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am beautiful just the way I am. I am strong. I can make giants fall through Christ who strengthens me. David would not let other people's negative thoughts and perceptions prevent him from being himself. And finally, he submits in his analysis that Goliath was so large, not just because he happened to be that big, but he suffered from a disease called acromegaly, a disorder in adults in which the pituitary glands produces too much growth hormone. This disease can affect bodily function and more specifically cause issues with vision. The final point declares that giants have weakness. Although giants can be scary, intimidating, and may appear as a threat to our well-being, it is to be realized that even our biggest giants have weakness. David was not dismayed because he understood this concept. Many of us today need to observe David's understanding. You may have been dealing with giants in your life, and it seems like there is no way for you to overcome. It seems like the bills are about to get the best of you. It seems like the semester will end with your defeat. Uh, it seems like your family's issues will tear your loved ones apart. Well, I've come to let you know that giants have weakness. I've come to let you know, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. I've come to let you know that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I've come to let you know that we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Why? 
because God is bigger than our giants. He is bigger than our depression. He's bigger than our debt. He's bigger than our failures. He's bigger than our haters. He's bigger than our weakness. Giants can fall. Giants can be defeated. Beloved, David was small and Goliath was big, but the stereotype was not true. Just because he was small did not mean he expected to experience defeat. David was well equipped to overcome. And I can imagine that one or two individuals understand what it's like to deal with a stereotype. Our ancestors were stereotyped by oppressors and denied the right to vote. Black individuals in this country are stereotyped and unjustly killed by the hands of police. Every day, we are stereotyped by mass media and propaganda. But we are here, but we still persist. We still make giants fall. The story of David and Goliath gives a great deal of insight on how to deal with stereotypes as well as the underdog thing. If you equip yourselves with the right tools, you can overcome giants. Don't let people's perceptions of you keep you from being who you are and doing what you do. If it don't turn you up, then tune it out. Three, giants have weakness. No giant is too big for God. Beloved, David was not an underdog. He was an undercover. And we can celebrate with David too. We are not expected to lose. We are not less than our opposition. We measure up and do not bow down. We are brilliant and well equipped for victory. Well equipped to overcome hatred. Well equipped to overcome voters' oppression. Well equipped to overcome brutality. Well equipped to overcome poverty and hunger. Well equipped to overcome midterms and finals. Well equipped to overcome depression and sadness. We do not serve an underdog God, but we serve a God who overcame the world. A God that gave his only son so we would not perish. A God who bled, wore a crown of thorns, and suffered on the cross. A God who they thought was dead, but three days later, but three days later, but three days later, got up with all power in his hand. They called him underdog. But I call him Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Tiskanu, Jehovah Shalom. They call him underdog, but I call him my healer, my way maker, my doctor in a sick room, my lawyer in a courtroom. They call him underdog, but I call him my provider, my peace in the midst of a storm. They call him underdog, but I call him my savior. I call him powerful. I call him the king of kings. Because of God, we are too able to overcome. And I got some news for every hater, every oppressor, everybody who's been waiting to watch us fall. I ain't your underdog. I ain't your underdog. I ain't your underdog. I'm not what you think about me. I'm not what you believe. I'm not what CNN said about me. I'm not what Fox News said about me. I am the child of a giant slayer. And if I can get one or two people to praise God, because giants do fall. Chains are breaking. Giants are falling. And I ain't your underdog. Well, Lord, 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 don't you know you sure been good to me? Well, Lord, Lord, well, well, he sure been good to me. I'm telling you the Lord, 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 well, sure been good to me. I'm telling you. Lord, 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 Lord,
bless my soul. Hey. I'm telling you the Lord. Well, well, he sure has blessed my soul. Just headed to get started. Working with a license, not ordained, but working with a licensed preacher. Let me tell you something. He's using his license. Amen, somebody. He's using his license. Thank you, preacher. There may be somebody here who heard him say, you're not an underdog. No reason for you to wait when you prayed long enough already been looking for a church home to work out your soul salvation, to work out your soul salvation, to work out your soul's, turn to your neighbor and tell them it's time to work it out. You don't have a church home that you're active in. The doors of the church are open and we encourage you to come bring your children so we can all grow in Christ together. Come as you are and support the ministry that you see. And let the Lord use you and give God the glory for your life. If you're here and you're ready, the doors of the church are open. Won't you come out of your pew and come to me? Give this preacher your hand and give God your heart and give the kingdom your service. Is there one? Lord, 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 somebody today, you ready? You ready? To me. I'm telling you the Lord, you ready, sure been good to me, I'm telling you the Lord, well, well, sure been good to me, I'm telling you the Lord, has really been just a word of prayer, eternal God, our Heavenly Father, as we come to this point in this great worship where we've seen so much score. God, thank you. Thank you. All these blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Lord, one of your sons, one of your daughters, who you died for, whose name you wrote in the book of life, who you've been good to, is here this morning. Somebody who knows you and knows there is none like you. But they're not active in their church home right now. Maybe they can't go. Maybe they moved. But, oh, God, thank you that today is the day of salvation. And we can still rejoice. Touch their hearts as only you can. And lead your child to their inheritance. Continue to work with each and every one of us here. That we'll be worthy of those you're sending. And loving as you've loved us. This is our prayer. Somebody say in Jesus name. And let the church say amen. amen. Give him a praise offering again. It's never late until it's too late. Never late till it's too late, but it does get to be too late. Thank God it's not too late today. Somebody who had a second thought, and you know you're not leaving the same way you came. Won't you come now? Lord, 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 you refuse to leave the same way you came. Will you come now? Oh, Lord, Lord, well, well, ye sure been. Is there one this morning? Well, Lord. Lord, Lord, keep coming. Sure, been. let the Lord use you. Tell him that the Lord has really been good. Has he been good? Did we get a word today? Did we see victories today? Did we get any blessings today? Come on, praise the Lord. 
And again, the Angel Church has a reception for you and prospective volunteers and parents in the Angel Church area. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.